So uh, today we're going to be talking about material flammability. Now, how does that relate to what we have been doing before? So, you know, you basically took my word when I said that uh, the heat release rate is the heat of combustion times a burning rate, and then I broke it down in the area, and I gave you a burning rate per unit area, and uh, and the heat of combustion, and uh, and then. Uh, I broke down the area and I got uh, the area as a function of this flame spread velocity and, uh, and the temperature, uh, sorry, and the time, and, uh, and then I substituted everything and came up with this expression and I said, well, all these are material properties, I'm going to lump them and put them in here, okay? And uh, so basically this is the expression <laughs> And, uh, and you all basically just took my word that that's what was the case, and we didn't have any further discussion. Now, the real question here is, uh, are these actually material properties? So this is a flame spread velocity. This is a burning rate per unit area. And this is the heat of combustion. Yeah. yeah. So the heat of combustion, we might say that within the bounds of an approximation of turning this into a one-step reaction, we can probably come up with some form of heat of combustion. Okay? And that might, to some extent, relate to the material. Is that okay? So maybe this one is okay. Uh, what about the flame spread velocity? That can't be, no? Because the problem is that the moment I just change orientations, the flame spread velocity is going to change. And, uh, and remember the whole thing about the length scale and all these things? Clearly, that is not a material property. It is some sort of number that comes out as a function, maybe, of maybe many material properties. But it really, in itself, is not a material property, no? Yeah? It, it, the reason that last time I was thinking was mostly related to like the, the context of the burning. So you said the orientation is going to determine what I'll take out of it. Yeah, so it's going to depend very much on the context of the burning. So if you put an external flow that is very strong, is you're going to have a different flame spread that you have very little flow. You know, if you put the orientation in, a, in horizontal or vertical or lateral, you know, it's going to be different. So this clearly is not a material property. And, uh, and what about the burning rate? Yeah. So it's going to depend on a, on a lot of things. In, for example, if you have a charring material, it's actually going to decay in time. So effectively, that's not a material property either. Okay? Now, why uh, we deal with this as a material property and call all this alpha is just purely as a matter of simplification. No? Effectively, you're assuming that all your materials are sitting on the ground, and therefore they're burning horizontally, and the conditions are more or less going to be the same. So you kind of eliminate, in a, in a very uh, arbitrary manner, all the parameters that condition that. And you say, chairs burn with an alpha of 0 0.01. Okay, and that's the end of the story. Now, obviously, as we looked uh, yesterday, if you're in going to introduce that into a simple model that has only two control volumes, to compare it, you know, with an egress time that has a pre-movement time that is conditioned, you know, by the insanity of the people in the room, you know, effectively, it's all more or less consistent, no? But clearly, this is probably the place where we run the most into trouble. Because it is when it doesn't behave as normal, when you actually need to understand what components are not necessarily material properties. Is that okay? So it is worth actually digging a little bit more into this problem because effectively this is probably one of the places where we have our biggest failures. So if you think of Grenfell Tower, we have a problem of that nature. If you think of uh, the Rhode Island nightclub, we have a problem of that nature. And so in many ways, 
when we address the materials themselves is when we probably have the biggest mistakes. So it's worth having a little bit deeper understanding of how these things work so that we can actually anticipate you know, when that alpha that we were using for our design purposes might actually not be an appropriate value, okay? So material properties, as we did yesterday, we're going to be introducing them into the equations by means of this design fire, you know? So we get the alpha T squared. And uh, so we're gonna take the heat of combustion, the flame spread velocity, and the burning rate, and effectively, uh, we're going to find some sort of scale test uh, that is going to eventually lead me to this alpha. That's the way we've been operating so far, okay? But the reality is that clearly that is not the case. So if you are, you know, Lord Norman Foster and you want to design the library in Astana, uh, you want to do something exciting, okay? And uh, so this image is of uh, Foster's design of the library in Astana. And I mentioned this to you the other day. And I showed you uh, a video that basically looked at all the materials that actually cover every balcony of this library. OK? So when I showed that video of the deck pole, remember? Hmm? Yeah, so, so that material that is rendered in a ceramic uh, and has in the back a foam is effectively the material that Lord Foster wanted to use uh, for the Astana Library. Now, clearly, if I was to treat this problem in its most simplistic of manners, the alpha of this problem should be zero. Is that okay? Because the ceramic rendering has no heat of combustion, so the heat of combustion will be zero, which immediately will render the problem into alpha equals to zero. Now, once you look at what's going on, it is pretty clear that alpha is not equal to zero. So we need to look at the problem in a more careful way. Okay? In, in the opposite way, I mean, if you look at timber, so this is a block of timber, and this is a heater, and I'm heating the timber. The timber is going to char. Then at the surface, you get the ash. Uh, once the char is oxidized, and, uh, and effectively, timber is going to burn. But as we discussed, if I take this heat out, it is very unlikely that timber is going to burn on its own. So if you were to think, which of the two materials is worse, the timber or the deck pole? Seems like the deck pole is kind of worse, no? It will put itself out, it will self-extinguish. Is that okay? Unless you put it in the wrong place. I have to say, this is the best video. This guy is on the freaking leg. 
So what's worse, timber or deck pole? Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is, this is what tells you how complex material flammability is, no? You know, here you're mixing probably some combustible insulation with exposed lightweight timber uh, components that they're all facing each other in some sort of funny grid and the radiation between each other is very significant. So effectively you've created something, you know, and that is not necessarily linked to the material itself, but it's in the way the system is burning. Is that okay? So, so at the end, you know, what, 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 this, what we really need to do is to be able to separate what is the material from all these other conditions that affect the way in which the material burns. So we need to be able to create a framework that enables us to extract which are the real material properties that matter and put aside all the other things that are associated to the way in which it's burning. So the understanding of material flammability has evolved in time in a very straightforward manner. So we started by looking at material flammability as a function of a scenario test. So people were trying to recreate a scenario and try to use that information to extrapolate it into a, a real scenario, okay? Now, once that got exhausted, because we were using materials in ways that were so multiple in nature that we could not extrapolate, then we tried to create standardized systems that enables us to get some information that then we could use together with some equations or whatever in such a manner that we get uh, the answer that we want. This is the alpha t squared, okay? So we've created something that allows us to calculate something, okay? Then it got even more complicated, and then at that point we have, to, we have to actually put real theory behind it to try to understand how we extract the things that are relevant to the material from the things that are relevant to the scenario, okay? Because that's the only way in which we're going to be able to introduce the information into any possible scenario that we want to model, okay? So the easy one, and there's no question about it, is the heat of combustion. Okay, so we talked about this yesterday, and effectively, there's not much I can say about that other than the fact that you are going to have a heat of combustion, you're going to find it in any table, and, uh, and effectively, that is a number. Now, the only thing that is a problem when it comes to the heat of combustion is the misuse of the heat of combustion, okay? In other words, the heat of combustion in a theoretical way gives you the maximum possible energy release per kilogram of fuel that you have available. Is that okay? In other words, it assumes complete combustion and efficiency of one. Is that clear? So let's try to think about instruments that we use to evaluate the heat of combustion of a solid. Yes? Yep. Same? and the cone calorimeter, okay? So what's the difference between the two? One is complete combustion and the other one is what's called effective combustion. Is it? Yeah. The, the cone calorimeter is a slow chamber with uh, tubes in the heated environment. Yep. And uh, some tools is very small and probably Mm -hmm. because it's a very controlled chamber mm -hmm. compared to the cone calorimeter where you have entrainment on the sample surface. Okay. And radiation from the cone also reinforce the heat flux. And that makes a difference? All that makes a difference? And you get a different number? Okay. Uh, <coughs> this is quite amusing. Uh, Do you? Okay, uh, let's take something easy. What is the equation of propane? C3H8. Okay, so C3H8 plus O2 gives me CO2 
plus H two O. Is that okay? Are we happy with that? So how will I balance this? So I get three carbons. Is that okay? So here I get eight, so I need four. So effectively I have four plus six, that gives me 10. Are you all happy with that? Yes? Plus 20 N2 there. Hmm? Plus, if you're burning in air, it's going to be 20 N2 in addition. Yeah, I could put the nitrogen in there, but it's going to be in and out if it's perfectly complete combustion. So let's make my life easy and not add the nitrogen into the equation. Okay. Is that okay? So everybody would disagree with the simple representation of, uh, of the chemistry of uh, propane. No? OK. So let's do the heat of combustion then. So effectively, the heat of combustion okay, is going to be in joules per kilogram of fuel. Are we happy with that? No? So let's say, let's not talk about grams, but talk about kilograms. Okay. So how many kilograms would I have here? So the molecular weight of carbon is 12 times 3. And then what's our hydrogen? Eight. One, one. Plus 1 pl times 8. So I get 36 plus 8, 44. Are we happy with that? So 44 kilograms of propane are going to burn with how many kilograms of oxygen? Five times 32. 16 times 2, 32 times 5, 160. Is that OK? Are we happy with that? So what is the ratio between 160 and 44? Can anybody divide? It's three point something, but hmm? about four. Okay. So, effectively, if I was to get the heat of combustion per kilogram of fuel, I will get approximately fifty. Is that okay? Megajoules per kilogram. Is that clear? Yes? So that burns with 44. So if I want to now change the equation and do it in a different way, and instead of having the heat of combustion per kilogram of fuel, I do the heat of combustion per kilogram of oxygen. What will be the number? 44 over 160. Yeah, 44 or 160 times 50, no? Which would be basically a fourth of this, which will give me 12.5. I rest my case. How do you actually, what is the cone calorimeter? So basically, you're measuring the heat of combustion as a function of oxygen consumption. So instead of actually measuring the energy, what you're doing is you measure how much oxygen you consume. OK? And then you multiply by which number? There's five people here, please. What is the heat of combustion per kilogram of oxygen? Seriously? 13.1. Is that OK? It's 13.1. So the cone calorimeter is an instrument, for those of you who don't know, where effectively you make a material burn. And then you have a measurement at the end. And what you measure is the amount of oxygen that you consume. OK? okay? And once you measure the kilograms of oxygen that you consume, you multiply them by 13.1, and that gives you the energy that you released. But effectively, what you're doing is you're saying that your heat release rate is the heat of combustion per kilogram of fuel times the burning rate, okay? which is the same thing as the heat of combustion 
per kilogram of oxygen times the burning rate of oxygen. Yep. Yeah, so basically, instead of getting the specific value, which in this case is 50 for propane, okay, you can substitute here 13.1, okay, and effectively you're going to get the same number. Provided you're burning a saturated hydrocarbon. Well, you can get into the details, but effectively, yes, if you have oxygen inside or OH inside the hydrocarbon, you're going to start altering this number slightly. Okay, I, I agree. Or accelerate. But that's not the point I wanted to make. Yes, acetylene will be a big problem. Uh, what is the point I wanted to make? So if I do this using the oxygen consumption calorimetry, okay, the number I'm getting, I mean, I got 12.5, this is just an average value, okay, and I did the numbers very roughly. Okay, but the reality is that this is a heat of combustion for complete combustion. If I do the bomb calorimeter, what I'm going to do is put the material, gasify it completely, let it burn completely, and collect the energy. So I take the material, evaporate or paralyze all this, get gas, then burn it, okay? And then once you collect the energy, you divide this by the mass that you burnt, and then you get the heat of combustion but the number is the same. So whoever sold you the story that the cone calorimeter is an effective heat of combustion lied to you, okay? It's not, it never was, and it will never be, okay? It's complete heat of combustion. Yes? Sorry, so uh, why is the cone Well, we can get into, we're going to get into that in detail, but yes, effectively what it is is the, the, the problem, the big problem, and the reason why we want to use a cone calorimeter is because we never know this number. Okay, so this number we can measure, but this one we never know. So if I want to get this, I'm better off measuring the oxygen consumption, multiplying it by 13.1, and getting this. Yes? Yeah. We're talking about lower heating volumes or higher heating volumes? So what's the difference between the two of them? It's just uh, evaporated down water. Hmm? Just evaporated down water. Yeah, so we're talking about the one that doesn't have water. I mean, effectively, all I'm talking about is combusting the, the fuel, okay? So if you have an organic material, you have to consider heat sinks. So you're going to use, for example, in many cases, if you have moisture, you're going to have ranges. So for example, people burning waste will always be concerned about the lower and the upper values because that's the range in which things like water, for example, start affecting the overall heat of combustion. But as an arithmetic average, basically, okay, that basically takes into account moisture and takes into account all the potential heat sinks that you might have. Yeah. That is already being gasified. So you, you don't have the heat sink of the water. That's the higher value. And if you have the heat sink, you're subtracting it so you get the lower value. OK? okay? But I mean, is, is this point clear? OK, there's been so much said about the cone calorimeter and oxygen consumption calorimeter as a means to obtain a more precise estimate of the heat of combustion. And that is actually not the case. All it is is an assumption that effectively leads us to exactly the same place, which is the fact that it is the heat of complete combustion. OK? And I can repeat this for all of them, and it will get me exactly the same place. Plus or minus a little bit, this will all circle around that value of 13. OK? And effectively, it is more or less an approximation of the complete heat of combustion if expressed as a function of kilograms of oxygen consumed. Is that okay? Have I disappointed you? <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, so that's all it is. So now, what is the bomb calorimeter? You put it in a chamber, as I say, you gasify it, and then effectively you release all the energy by supplying sufficient oxygen. You collect that energy, and then you establish this number, which is per kilogram of fuel. Okay, because what you're measuring there is the mass of fuel that you put in there. Now, this has led to a lot of misconceptions. Okay? Because what happens if I have a material okay, that I'm going to put in my bomb calorimeter, and that material now has two components. It has a combustible material, and it has an inert. Okay? So 20% of it is calcium carbonate. Okay? And 80% of it is polyethylene. So what is the heat of combustion? It has to be more likely than the fuel mass to be put in. No. It is still the heat of polyethylene, because that's what's burning. The fact that you're throwing junk into, into your bomb calorimeter doesn't mean that you're altering the heat of combustion of polyethylene. Of course, yes, if you want to see what is the overall energy released, Okay, by a mixture of an inert and a solid, then you have to weigh it by the fractions that you have. Okay, but the polyethylene still has 44.6. It is an artifice of the way you measure. It's the same thing with the higher value and the lower value. The fact that you're evaporating water doesn't mean that the organic material doesn't have its heat of combustion. It still has it. It's that you have less mass burning. So what you're altering is this, not this. Is that okay? And the problem is that that interpretation that apparently reduces the heat of combustion by adding inert is actually a misinterpretation of the only thing that you're doing is reducing the amount of mass that you're burning. Okay? But the material is still the same. Now, many times people try to classify materials as a function of what they call the effective heat of combustion. And the effective heat of combustion becomes anything you want it to be. So it could be a weighted value with inert. Some people establish a uh, combustion efficiency. In other words, it's incompleteness of combustion. But that is not a material property anymore. That's part of the environment and the way you're burning it. So you should not be talking about that because you change the scenario and you change that efficiency. Yes? So there is uh, this thing that I've been seeing in Facebook that says the ideal value of combustion and the ideal heat of combustion. So what's the difference? The difference is that the ideal heat of combustion is the heat of combustion. Okay? The actual heat of combustion is the heat of combustion measured by the instrument. Okay? So if the instrument is giving you something that includes already an efficiency, then of course the number is going to drop down. So you mean it's the efficiency of the instrument? Of the instrumentation. Okay? So if I'm going to burn a material in a pool fire like the cone calorimeter, then effectively the entrainment, because it doesn't move in fast enough, is going to result in incomplete combustion. And because it's incomplete combustion, then effectively what you're going to get is a lower number. Is that okay? But that doesn't mean that you've altered the heat of combustion. All that you have done is you are in a scenario that is not efficient and therefore gives you a lower number. Okay? So this is very important because that's how the confusion start getting generated. Because people start labeling things without really necessarily understanding what it means. And the moment you start putting these labels, these labels start being carried over and then all of a sudden, they take a life of its own. Okay? And the reality is that doing the bomb calorimeter or doing the cone calorimeter should, in theory, give you fundamentally the same answer. And all the variants that you could have are mostly related to the fact that in one case you're burning in one way, in another case you're burning in a different way, and therefore you have two different efficiencies okay, that are basically linked to the instrumentation. Is that clear? So now that we've clarified that, uh, now we can move on. Now we understand what the heat of combustion is, and um, 
<coughs> and we can say, well, fair enough, I have my thing. This one, these are the three, the supposedly material properties, done. Okay? Now we know what we're talking. Okay? So now let's move to the next one. Ah, what do we do to determine the flame spread velocity? Hmm? Yeah, so we have to figure out how it's growing, okay? Now we recognize and we know that that is going to be scenario dependent. Is that okay? So all I can do is take one specific scenario. I'll explain you how to get the flame spread velocity, okay? And then, you know, we can, we can leave it there. But every time you change scenarios, you will have to change the way in which you address the problem, but the fundamental principles remain the same. Is that okay? So let's look at, at flame spread then. So obviously then we're gonna look at the burning rate and we'll go from there. So this is flame spread, okay? Now, let me explain that diagram and, uh, and I'll give you a little bit of a, uh, of a history around this. So here's a material. The material has a thickness L Part of it has been heated and is pyrolyzing, okay? Uh, the gases are coming out and they're combusting and this is the lead, leading edge of the flame. I'm going to be looking only at opposed flame spread. The flame is radiating back into the surface, sustaining the gasification and if there is a flow, there's gonna be convective flow, so there's gonna be convective heat transfer and that is going to help also gasify the material, okay? The flame is going to try to spread into the cold material in this direction, but to be able to do that, that flame needs to transfer heat from the flame into the material, but also overcome the heating of the gas. Is that okay? So far away, the gas is at ambient temperature, but as it approaches the flame, it starts increasing its temperature until it reaches the flame temperature at the tip of the flame. Is that okay? The solid, far away, is at ambient temperature, but as it approaches this point here, where the gasification starts, it is going to reach this ignition temperature that we talked about uh, on Tuesday, and, uh, and it's gonna remain almost constant because the material is pyrolyzing, so you are effectively using all your energy to gasify fuel. Temperature is not increasing anymore. Is that okay? The limiting factor is the energy supply to give you the fuel that is coming out. So, you're going to have a thermal depth that is the region that is being heated, so the temperature is hot at the surface and it's gonna get cold by the time it gets to that depth, okay? There's going to be heat transfer from this hot area through the solid into the material to increase its temperature. The material has properties, a density, specific heat, and thermal conductivity. And there's going to be transfer through the gas phase to heat the gas, and the gas has its properties, density, specific heat, and uh, thermal conductivity, okay? You might potentially have a source of external heat in other words, if there's a fire in the corner, that may be radiating to another fire within the room, okay? So in principle, there could be an extra term in here that might be there or might not be there. So those are all the variables that are playing in there, okay? And this is where it starts becoming interesting because if you look at it, okay, we have a flame, that flame is being fed by the, 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 the fuel, the fuel is being generated by feedback. And I can first say, well, if the flame is actually burning, I don't really care what this feedback is because all I know is that there's sufficient to create enough fuel to get the flame here. I'm interested in the problem ahead of the flame. Everybody comfortable with that? So I can forget a little bit about this for the meantime. Okay. Now I have two paths of heat, one through the gas phase, coming in from the flame, heating up the gases, and then landing through the surface into the solid. 
Okay? And I have another path, okay, which is basically through the solid going in into the material through the solid phase. Two paths for the energy. Now, in 1967, uh, a gentleman whose surname was Sanchez Tarifa created a theory that effectively started by saying that the controlling mechanism of flame spread was heat transfer through the solid phase. Okay? Two years later, uh, a guy from Factory Mutual, student of Howard Emmons, uh, came up, John DeRis, came up with a model whose paper in the Combustion Symposium was entitled Flame Spread by Heat Transfer through the Gas Phase. Okay? So within two years, these two papers came out and effectively put two completely divergent schools of thought. The group of people that were behind Tarifa effectively believed that heat transfer is through the solid phase. And you can neglect heat transfer through the gas phase. John Deris, in his PhD, he demonstrated that actually the heat transfer is dominant through the gas phase and you can neglect heat transfer through the solid phase. So what happened, you know, was Third World War. You know, for a period of 10 years, the camps started building and every name in the flame spread community, you know, were the East Coasters versus the West Coasters. So effectively, uh, the nephew of Sanchez Tarifa moved to the University of California, Berkeley, and happened to be my supervisor, which is Carlos Fernandez Pello, okay? And he moved to the West Coast, and he was supervised by Foreman Williams at UCSD, and they all claimed you know, that heat transfer was through the solid phase. Okay? And then the East Coasters, which were all the students of Howard Emmons and Hoyt Hotel from MIT, you know, all moving into FM Global, NIST, they were all staunchly arguing that it was through the gas phase. Okay? And papers come, papers go, so you get like the 11th, the 12th, 13th, the 14th, the 15th symposiums. There's papers on flame spread left and right. And when you read the commentary, the level of insult that is going from one side to the other one is extraordinary. So you know that Japanese people like consensus. Okay? So uh, Professor Toshi Hirano invited Fernandez Peyo to Japan okay, to basically reach you know, the consensus. Okay? So Hirano seemed to be more in the camp of John de Riz, and uh, but nevertheless wanted to bring consensus. So we had to take it out of North America, you know, put it in Japan, and see if we could settle the debate. A paper emerged in 1982 in Combustion Science and Technology calling Controlling Mechanisms of Flame Spread. And you know what the conclusion was? They're both wrong and they're both right. Okay? Because in some cases, for example, like in fuel beds, like in the case of forest fires and so forth, the controlling mechanism, because of the porous media and the low thermal conductivity of the porous media, the controlling mechanism is through the gas phase. Okay? In other cases, for example, when you have thin films of highly conductive materials, the controlling mechanism is through the solid phase. What this paper, Controlling Mechanisms of Flame Spread, did was actually created all the non-dimensional equations that effectively told you in which cases you were on this camp and which cases you were on the other camp. Now, the sad part about this whole thing and, uh, and it was that at the end, once you put everything in place, while well, everybody was right and wrong at the same time, what ended up happening is that 90% of all materials of interest in fire, the heat transfer is dominantly through the gas phase. Okay? So basically, there's very few cases where this QS is actually relevant. And in the majority of the cases, the controlling mechanism is actually through the gas phase. Now, needless to say, uh, out of that paper came up a whole series of other papers where effectively people assessed you know, what, what, what was that process that eventually leads to flame spread uh, or post-flame spread.
Now, I mentioned the other day the paper by Chen and Tian, so that's one of the papers that emerged from that period. And effectively, everybody became more or less in agreement you know, that most, in most cases, the controlling mechanism is through the gas phase. Now, the interesting thing about this is that at the end, it's gone so far that people have completely forgotten that there is another way of spreading a flame through the solid phase. And almost every flame spread model of today actually will use gas phase heat transfer and completely neglect the solid phase heat transfer. Okay? So then we've settled the problem and we are going to an analyze flame spread by actually heating this region of the material through the gas phase in such a way that we bring it from the ambient temperature to the pyrolysis or the ignition temperature. In other words, if I transfer sufficient heat from the flame to the solid to bring the temperature from here to here, then the flame will jump from this point to this point. Is that okay? So this distance divided by the time that it takes to ignite, okay, is going to be effectively the rate of flame spread. Okay? So, let's do the energy balance. Very simple energy balance. this up a little bit. Okay. So, here's my flame, T flame, T ignition, T ambient, ambient okay and I'm gonna have heat going in this direction okay Uh, well, what would normally happen here, this is the anchor point, okay? And this is a generally a very complicated position because what you're going to have here is a partially premixed flame at both ends and a diffusion flame in the middle, so you get the triple flame that anchors that point. And you will have a standoff distance because you cannot get it too close because this temperature of ignition is too low for the flame to exist. So if this becomes too close, then the flame dies. So you will create a standoff distance, which is the first point where you actually have a stable flame. Okay, but the chemistry is so slow that you get diffusion going through and the chemistry cannot go fast enough. So you establish this triple flame where you have a lean flame on the outside, a rich flame on the inside, and then you get the premixed in the middle. And that's just simply because this is the coldest point of the flame, so the flame is almost dying at that point, okay? So this will always be there, that standoff distance, okay? Obviously, you can make this model as complicated as you can, but the objective here is to try to make it as simple as possible, just purely on the basis of an energy balance, okay? So basically, this thickness here that is being preheated, I'm gonna call it delta S, and it's going to be unit depth, okay? So let's just make it as a two-dimensional problem. So you have unit depth, and uh, the heat is coming in this direction, okay? So if, if I use the terms that I put in that expression, then what will be the energy that you are supplying? Q. Hmm? 
QF, and that QF goes through what area? Okay, so basically you're going to supply that QF, okay, through an area that is going to be delta S times one, times one. Is that okay? So effectively your supply is going to be QF times delta S, okay? And that energy that you're supplying is supposed to heat up the solid from the ambient temperature to the ignition temperature. Is that okay? Now, part of the, the controlling mechanisms of flame spread basically reaches the conclusion that the energy needed to heat up the solid is so much greater than the energy to heat up the gas that effectively you can neglect the energy that is used to heat up the air. Okay? Now, what they did was a really, really interesting thing because if, if you neglect that, that basically means you have a robust flame that is well anchored and the energy that is being lost to heat up the gas is minimal, okay? But if I start blowing harder and I approach blow off, then what happens is I start cooling the flame, okay? And my damp color number starts dropping very rapidly. So Fernandez Peyo plotted this beautiful plot in which effectively he had the damp color number as a function of the velocity, okay? And what is going to happen is that it's almost one, and then it gets to the point where you get a critical velocity that starts plummeting down, okay? So effectively, for this regime, which is a robust flame, we can neglect heat through the gas, to the gas, okay? So, so the gas basically is not taking any energy, it's very little. The velocities are low enough, and what dominates, we are assuming that all the energy goes into the solid. Okay? So what goes on the other side of the equal sign? Okay, so... It has to be Cp delta T, no? No? But what goes in front? It has to be the density of the solid and the flame spread velocity. Is that okay? Because this is energy per unit time, okay? Multiplied by the length, multiplied by one gives me effectively what, and that's it. Hold on. Here, density times velocity is going to, times one, is going to give me mass per unit time that is being heated times Cp times delta T gives me watts at this side. Is that okay? Yes? Uh, sorry, you said a question about the depth. Yep. No, 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 no. What you're doing is imagine this same equation, but the velocity of the air times the, times the density of the air times the Cp of the air. So if I have this value very big, then I have to heat up this amount of air. And the flame doesn't have the capacity to do it, so the flame starts cooling down. Okay? And the moment the flame starts cooling down, your dumb color number starts plummeting and you get blow off, okay? Now, that will never happen with a solid because the flame is transferring heat to the solid and what happens is that if the flame cannot transfer enough heat to the solid, it moves slower. So eventually, the worst thing that could happen is that it stops propagating. That will be the limit. Effectively, you don't have enough heat to be able to bring it to the T ignition. Is that okay? But because you're heating the solid, it's only you're gonna move when you manage to heat up the solid. And if it takes you forever, it'll take you forever, okay? Now, the eigenvalue here is this. So this is what you're going to extract from the equation, okay? So from here, I get the flame spread velocity, okay? And it's gonna be the heat of the flame 
times delta S divided by oops, the density, the specific heat of the solid, T ignition minus T infinity. Is that okay? I'm missing one term. Let's assume there's no heat losses. No, there's no heat losses. Yes, of course, I will have to include radiation, I will have to include all these extras. But let's assume they're all gone, okay, for the meantime, the simplest version. What am I missing? It's just my units are wrong. I'm missing something. Exactly. Now, I need to be able to heat what depth? Hmm? Yeah, and the question is, what is the surface that I'm interested in? Now, if you say that there effectively is a very high activation reaction, then the surface will be tiny, okay? But there will still be energy transfer to the inside, and you still need to take that into account. Is that okay? So the way they represented it, so if you look at this, this is meters per second, this is kilograms per meter cube, this is joules per kilogram Kelvin, this is Kelvin, so Kelvins go out, kilograms go out, meters go with meters, and I get joules per second, which is watts, divided by meter cube. Sorry, meter squared. Okay? So I multiply by one, which is the depth, and this one goes away, and I get watts per meter. So on the other side, I had watts per meter squared multiplied by meters, times meters, which is the one depth. So this goes away, okay, and I have a unit problem. And the unit problem is that I need a depth that is being heated, but I really don't know what that depth is. Is that okay? So that depth, I just put it in there as delta T, and effectively that delta T has to be here, okay? And that delta T has to be here. Is that clear? Yeah? Now we have everything fine, because once I put the delta T, I get another meters in here that goes away with this one, and I get watts on this side and watts on this side. Okay? But these are the unknowns. This is your equation. I don't know what this number is. Is that okay? I don't know what the heat flux is. I don't know what the thickness or the thermal length is. I could use chain and TNs and say that it's going to be alpha divided by U infinity, okay? But I don't know really what it is. And I don't know what this is. So after this paper, Controlling Mechanisms of Flame Spread, everybody agreed that this was the energy balance, okay? And from then on, everybody has disagreed forever on what these terms are, okay? Until Quintieri came out from the clouds, okay? And really, I mean, there, there is a very interesting thing because you have all the scientists, no? And all the scientists are banging their heads trying to figure out how to estimate the delta T. So, you know, you have a Tien, James Tien, you know, at Case Western, coming up with all these characteristic length scales and try to put it in there, embedding this in numerical models. You have Fernandez Peyo doing all his measurements and trying to get you know, an analysis that effectively allows him to calculate all these terms. And you will find an infinite number of different equations that effectively represent exactly the same energy balance. Not one of them can be used in any practical form because every single one of them has all these elements that are missing and that effectively are constructed as a function of experiments or some very specific analysis and all the stuff. So then came Quintieri. So Quintieri was a in incredibly theoretical in many ways, understood the physics of the problem, but he had an incredibly practical mind. You know, and effectively said, well, how 
do I turn this equation into something that anybody can actually use, that can be used for the purposes of understanding flammability, and that can be used for the purposes of explaining a problem in a manner such that you can use it in, pra in a practical way. So the first thing he said, well, there's two types of materials. There's materials that are thermally thin. So what does it mean to be thermally thin? No temperature gradients. No temperature in other words, if it's pyrolyzing at the surface, it's pyrolyzing at the other end. So the whole thing is gasified, paper. Okay, paper is a thermally thin material and it's gasified. So if the whole thing is at the same temperature, then what would delta be? The thickness of the material, is that okay? So delta T becomes L, is that okay? So his equation then for thermally thin materials, the for flame spread, is going to be the heat flux of the flame times delta S, okay? And you get rho S C P S T ignition minus T infinity multiplied by L. And that's the equation for flame spread for a thermally thin material. Now you know this, now you know this, now you know this, now you know this, and now you know this, and this is the one that is missing. Okay? So what Quintier is going to say, well, let's forget about the fact that the heat is coming through a certain area, let's lump all this into a single parameter that we're going to call phi. Okay? And how am I going to get this parameter? I'm going to run an experiment, measure the flame spread. Since I know everything else, I can find phi. Is that okay? So if the experiment has to go up, then it will go up. If the experiment has to go lateral, it will go lateral. Okay? But effectively, this particular term, which is very much related to what is happening in the gas phase, in other words, it's not part of the material, okay, represents your scenario. Well, everything else is the material properties. Is that okay? So then, now I know that the density and the specific heat will dominate over the flame spread. So if I have very low density, then what happens? Very fast flame spread. Is that okay? If I have a material with a very low ignition temperature, then I get very fast flame spread. I know which specific material properties will control the rate of flame spread. And everything that is scenario dependent is separated into this parameter phi in such a way that I'm going to evaluate it on the basis of a representative experiment. Okay? So are we happy with that? So then he said, well, then there's the other type, thermally thick. So in a thermally thick material, what you get is effectively a gradient of temperature, no? So if your material is this thick, only this part will be heated. This is the ignition, and this is the ambient. And this is the hot part, everything else is cold. No, all, you're going to have a gradient if you want, okay? But the assumption that he's going to make is that for the flame to spread, this entire bulk will have to be heated to the ignition temperature, okay? That's, that's the way he postulates it. Is that okay? Are we happy with that? So then he says, well, how do I find delta? He says, well, the heat of the flame is heating this, okay? And then it's going in through conduction. So the heat of the flame is going to be K, T ignition minus T ambient divided by delta T. He does a linear approximation of conduction where he says the heat coming in 
that's the boundary condition, has to go through, through conduction. So he linearizes conduction, okay, and effectively says, this is solid, this is the flame heat, okay? So he substitutes delta T, so now delta T is going to be uh, K T ignition minus T infinity over QF, okay? And he substitutes it back into this equation. So you plug it in here. So T ignition minus T infinity square, K multiplies rho C, okay? And the QF goes up to the square value, okay? So effectively, now, with that delta T, your flame spray velocity becomes QF squared delta S divided by K of the solid, rho of the solid, CP of the solid, T ignition minus T infinity squared. Okay? Once again, this is a scenario and this are the material properties. Okay? So the new phi for a thermally thick, this is thin, this is thick, is going to be now Q double prime F squared delta S. Okay? So are we comfortable with that concept? Okay, so effectively I did an energy balance. I represented in terms that I actually, many of them I couldn't calculate. Then what I did is I had to separate the problem into two to be able to treat two types of materials in a different way. And the delta T here becomes L, which effectively separates all the material properties from the scenario dependent properties. And here, I put a delta T by just basically linearizing the boundary condition and effectively got K rho C multiplied by T ignition minus T infinity squared. Here are all the scenario properties and here you get all the material properties. Okay? So this is what Quintini calls the thermal inertia. Okay? And it's the product of the thermal conductivity, the density and the specific heat. Now, in this particular case, he is assuming global or average properties. So he's not discriminating the fact that as you go deeper, you're going to be colder and therefore the properties are going to change. So these are effective properties, okay? which ends up being a little bit of a problem that needs to be addressed. But these are effective properties. This is the ignition condition, the fast chemistry. okay, and we have an expression for the flame spread velocity for both types of materials, okay? So everybody's comfortable with that? So, so then if I take this, here's my energy balance. Okay, I'm going to solve for the flame spread velocity. Here's the flame spread velocity. And for a thermally thick material, I get this as the value of the, of the uh, thermal depth. And for a thermally thin, it's equal to L. Okay, now if I substitute this into this equation, then I get the two expressions that I put in the board. Okay, now, the first thing that we need to differentiate is what is a thermally thin material and what is a thermally thick material. So before you actually run your experiment, you have to make sure that you're running the correct experiment. Okay? And for that, we're going to resort to the Biot number. So effectively, what you do is you take your heat transfer boundary condition and you say it's coming in through a total heat transfer coefficient times T hot minus TS. So T hot minus TS <coughs> multiplied by a total heat transfer coefficient gives me the heat flux going in. That heat flux going in has to come in through conduction. 
Okay, so it's going in through conduction. So if I linearize the whole problem and scale it down, effectively this becomes Ts minus Tb, hot minus cold, divided by L, the thickness, times the thermal conductivity is equal to this. And then I rearrange the terms, and I bring this temperature difference here, and multiply the L here and divide by K. So here is this non-dimensional parameter, and here's this non-dimensional temperature. Okay? So what is a thermally thin material? A thermally thin material is a material where Ts and Tb are almost the same when compared to the difference between the outer temperature and the surface temperature. So if most of the change happens in the gas phase and very little in the solid phase, this term here turns, tends basically to a very small number, and that's a thermally thin material. A thermally thick material is the opposite, where effectively the difference of temperatures in the gas phase is very small, and the difference of temperatures in the solid phase is very large. So this number is very large, this number is very small, this parameter basically is very large. So if I take my heat transfer coefficient, the thickness of the material and the thermal conductivity, and it gives me a number of 100, I know I'm in the condition that corresponds to thermally thick. If I take these terms and it gives me 0 0.001, I know I'm in this condition here. Is that okay? Kurt, you still have to, you still have to estimate your film coefficient. Of course. Of course, you have to estimate, you have to put an estimate. Is that okay? So, that's a biot number. And effectively, if you have a biot number that is much smaller than one, you tend towards thermally thin. And uh, if it's much greater than one, you tend to thermally thick. Now, of course, many people will argue, uh, where do fire materials end? Well, the majority are thermally thick. So even if you have a very rough idea of your heat transfer coefficient or your film coefficient, you still will always land with a value that is much greater than one, okay? Very rare you get thermally thin materials, and generally it's quite obvious. I mean, it will be paper, that type of material, fabrics. You know, very, very thin materials that effectively allow you to operate like that. So what's the process then? So before you get started and decide which equation you're going to use, you evaluate your biot number. Once you get your biot number, then you decide if it's thermally thin or thermally thick. And then as a function of that, you have different expressions to deal with. OK? So most materials are going to behave as thermally thick. So I'm going to pay more attention to thermally thick materials. But the process will be exactly the same for thermally thin. So if I look at the flame spread velocity, and I substitute the delta T, then effectively what you get is this expression here, which is the expression that I put in here. So it's the flame heat flux squared times the, air, the area through which the heat comes in, divided by the thermal inertia, multiplied by the difference of temperatures to the square power. Okay? So Quintieri will then say this is the value of phi, and that represents everything that is scenario dependent. While everything in the bottom is material dependent and therefore can be used, for example, for classification of materials, OK? So this is what he will describe as his material properties. Oops. And this will be the scenario dependent third material property that he will talk about. So Quintieri is going to try to evaluate the three material properties, phi, k rho c, and T ignition, OK? Now, the thermal inertia comes all together, so there's absolutely no need to separate all three terms. You can just deal with this as the thermal inertia. But we need to recognize that these two are really material properties, while this one is scenario dependent. So if I change the geometry or change the scenario, I need to change the test so that I get a different value of phi. Is that OK? Yep. Yes. Sorry, I, I can see how um, like the characteristics of the thickness is always going to change, but um, how, how much does this um, the, the rate of heat flux change? It doesn't. So it's purely the heating length. 
Yeah, so, so effectively the flame is only going to change when you have heavily fire retarded materials, where effectively the flame, is, the flame chemistry is being strongly uh, transformed by the chemicals that you're putting into the, uh, in, 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 into the gas phase. Okay? But generally, no, it, it won't change. It changes very little. And really, the main parameter that you're assessing here is, oops, uh, is going to be the, the heating length. Is that okay? Okay, so let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll pick it up from there.